Okay, we're looking at the, the properties of the elements and bond types. We're going to look at two bond types today, the ionic bond and the uh, covalent bond, because they help us to understand uh, most of the elements and what, and what they do. Uh, first of all, we'll look at metals. Metals are known for being hard, shiny, good conductors of heat and electricity. They form cations, which means they lose electrons. In fact, uh, there's only one metal that ever even gets a negative charge when it's, when it's in the cation form, it's rhenium. Uh, all the other metals will only form positive charges. They're malleable, which means you can, uh, you can hammer them into different shapes. They're ductile, which means you can draw them through a small hole and form them into wires. And they tend to lose electrons in chemical reactions. Nonmetals, on the other hand, are either gases or brittle solids at room temperature. When they are solid, they're usually dull and poor conductors of heat and electricity. And they tend to gain electrons in chemical reactions. Um, so, for example, if you have, and the, the rule of thumb I usually teach is that if two elements are far apart on the periodic table, they're going to form an ionic substance. And when they're close together on the periodic table, they more generally will form a covalent uh, bonds, they tend to share electrons. It's about the electronegativity, really. If the electronegativity of an element is high, it tends to hog the electrons when it's in a bond, so the bond will have more ionic character. It's not a cut and dried relationship, it's more like a continuum. If you're on one end of the continuum, you have uh, a tendency to form ionic bonds. If you're on the other end of the continuum in terms of electronegativity, then um, you will tend to form. Uh, covalent bonds. So if the electronegativities of two elements are close together, they will form a covalent bond. If on the other hand they're a large difference in electronegativities, it's going to be an ionic bond where the electrons are practically traded rather than shared. So here's an example of a substance uh, that is ionically bonded because the, the electronegativity between lithium and fluorine is quite large. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. Lithium is a metal and it's an alkali metal at that, which they tend to have very low electron uh, electronegativities. So you see lithium here with its one valence electron. Fluorine has uh, seven valence electrons. When they form an ionic compound, lithium loses the electron and gives it to fluorine, which becomes a fluoride anion. Lithium becomes a cation, and then the two are attracted to each other uh, electrostatically. And when you get ionic solids, because the electrostatic attraction is a strong one, they tend to be quite hard, but they're also brittle because the, uh, the strength of the crystal is predicated on positive and negative charges being right next to each other. If you, if you, if you move the crystal ever so slightly, now what happens is the positive and the positives get aligned and, and negatives and negatives get aligned, the crystal cracks. And that's why, and that's why electrostatic um, attraction will produce strong but brittle substances. They can't move. The crystal isn't flexible. Uh, metalloids have properties of both metals and nonmetals. They're often used in the manufacture of semiconductors which have a gated flow of electricity. For example, they allow electricity to flow under some conditions but not others, which makes them useful in electronic circuitry. The whole basis of electronic circuitry is to control the flow of electricity and to make very often just binary decisions, a yes or no circuit. And if you have enough of those circuits in, uh, connected, you can get a logic circuit. How do we um, name chemical formulas? Well, usually what I start with is by introducing the notion of ionic or covalent compounds. If it's ionic, you use the metal as is. So for example, if we made, an uh, if we made a compound with sodium and chlorine, once it formed the sodium chloride, when you name it, you take the, the, the metal part, you always put the metal first, and you write, you write just as its name, sodium. Periodic table sodium is sodium. It remains sodium when you name it as an ion or compound. And then you put an I ending on the non-metal. So sodium chloride, potassium chloride, lithium chloride, and so on. Those are all ionic compounds. If on the other hand you have a covalent substance, if, if the two things are pretty close on the periodic table, they have similar electronegativities, then they're going to form a covalent compound where the electrons are shared. So if you're, for example, we have phosphorus combining with chlorine, we get phosphorus trichloride, and that's a molecular or a covalent compound. Now let's move on to the idea of Lewis structures. The Lewis structures were designed as a way of accounting for the location of the valence electrons. 
All chemistry takes place as a result of, of, of the exchange or the sharing of outer shell electrons. They're called valence electrons. Uh, so everything we call chemistry, all the chemical reactions takes pl take place because the outer shell of electrons is either shared or, or lost to another atom. So when an atom loses electrons, actually we call that oxidation. If an atom gains electrons, we call that reduction. But we, we pick up on that in another chapter on electrochemistry. So when you want to draw a Lewis structure, the first thing you have to do is account, is count up all the valence electrons for all the atoms involved in the molecule. Then you choose a central atom. Usually the single one is the, is the central atom, if there is a central atom. Three, you place the satellite atoms around the central atom, connecting each one with one bond using one line. One line symbolizes two electrons. Fourthly, you place the remaining electrons on the satellite atoms until octets are achieved. What is an octet? Each atom likes to have eight electrons in its uh, vicinity whether they actually are used for bonding or just close to the atom. And you'll see when I do the example what I mean by that. Fifthly, place the remaining electrons on the central atom, if there are any left, uh, electrons left over. And then we check for charges, and we reorganize the molecule by turning lone pairs into bonding pairs, if necessary, to refine the, uh, the Lewis structure. Then we again check for octet and charge requirements, and we can state formal charges if there are any. So for example, let's write the Lewis structure of oxygen. We begin by counting up how many valence electrons oxygen has. Oxygen, two oxygen molecules, recall that oxygen is a diatomic gas. Two oxygen molecules, with each oxygen atom having six valence electrons, means there's 12 electrons in, uh, in naturally occurring oxygen. So we start by drawing the two oxygen atoms with a line between them. That line uses up two electrons. And then uh, once we've used up two electrons, there's 10 more to account for. So what I did is I went two, four, six, eight, 10. That uses up all the remaining electrons, but it's something peculiar happens. What we have is one oxygen with three lone pairs on it, and the other oxygen only has two lone pairs on it. So what are we going to do about that? Well, let's check the octet requirement for each oxygen atom. The left oxygen atom has two, four, six, eight electrons. So its octet requirement is met. The right oxygen atom has two, four, six, electrons in it, so its octet requirement is not met. So I put a little check mark for the left oxygen, an X for the right oxygen. There's lack of symmetry there too, which is always a little bit disturbing when it comes to things that occur in nature. Uh, then we look at the charges. The charge on the oxygen atom, the way we count up charges is we each lone pair counts for two, each bonding pair counts for one. So this oxygen atom on the left has two, four, six, plus one, seven electrons in its possession, so it's going to have a negative charge because it actually only wants six. This oxygen atom on the right hand has in its possession two, four, plus one, five electrons, so in fact it's going to have a plus one charge. So we have a negative charge on this one and a positive charge on this on this one, the way it's drawn. I forgot to write that in. That would be an, overcharge, an overall charge of zero on the whole molecule, but a molecule with two formal charges we can probably improve upon. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this lone pair as per the, um, uh, the indication of rule number six and we're going to turn it into a bonding pair. Now we have double bonded oxygen and two lone pairs on each oxygen, oxygen atom and it's more symmetrical looking as well which might, which might bring us closer to what the true molecule looks like. The left oxygen atom now possesses two, four, six, eight electrons in its octet. Octet requirement is met for the left oxygen atom. The right oxygen atom has two, four, six, eight as well. Now let's check for the charge. Remember when we check for charges, uh, bonding pairs count for one, lone pairs count for two. Two, four, five, six. So this oxygen possesses six uh, uh, electrons, check on that. This oxygen is two, four, five, six as well. So that is the Lewis structure for oxygen. It's a double bonded with two lone pairs on the oxygen atoms. We can, uh, I think we can stop there. For homework, you can try doing nitrogen. Uh, the final answer would be that nitrogen is triple bonded. But let's see if you can reason your way through it.